So um, welcome to the classroom. Um, it's going to be quite a full room, but I'm going to be quiet. And if there's any questions, you could, I believe, raise your hand or um, I will try to look for your raised hand and we try to keep it uh, short and succinct and give people a chance to ask questions. Oh, oh, he's like raising his hand for real. Go ahead, Dan. You know, there is a raise the hand button. Go ahead, Dan Evans. Hi. Uh, first of all, just that was so amazing. That was just like cool. blue you. the whole time. So thank you for your generosity. Um, I think somebody started that. You, you touched on this based on somebody else's question. But I, my question is, do you think there's a way to integrate generative or transmedia methods into foundational design courses? And what might that look like to you? I, it, I, I am coming from this uh, angle of a public university where we have a more condensed program, but mm -hmm. we want our students to sort of, you know, maybe get into that sooner, or even if it, or do you think it really relies on having foundational design skills before you add that complexity? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, um, our generative design, we had a, we had a, we had a class called VXD1 generative design that was phased out. And that was a class that students, um, were taking maybe third term, their third term in it. So it was, it was at right at the beginning of their educational experience. And what we found is that they would take, they would take a class like that. And, um, and then, you know, they wouldn't be able to apply it. We wouldn't be able to apply it to a graphic design project until they were a little bit later on, you know, maybe fifth or sixth term in, in our curriculum. And so, um, you know, they, they forgot all that they learned. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think it can be taught at the beginning, but I think what's important is that it's applicable to graphic design, that they have a sense of, of, of how to contextualize the work and how to apply the work. And this is something that Roy, Roy's been talking a lot about too. And it's very important, you know, it was an opportunity space within the curriculum that we had when that gen design class was phased out for us to, to really reinvigorate some new energy in that space. Um, so it's, it's something that Roy's given great thought to. Yeah, I think it can definitely be taught earlier on in the, in like a student's time in school. But like Brad mentioned, I think the one thing that I've noticed and that I experienced myself, um, when I was in school is that without the, without a project to apply what you're learning to, you kind of, it's kind of like in one ear out the other in a lot of ways. So you know, typically when you're loading, learning programming or code, you're doing a lot of reading, you're watching a lot of like YouTube tutorials. And unless you have the opportunity to try to experiment with that in a very applied way, a lot, a lot of the times students will just forget by the time that they have the chance to do it. So I think like, I think it would be cool to have a curriculum where that, that is taught earlier on, you know, and maybe the, the projects in the class are, are tailored to like, maybe you, you do like three focused projects and each like all the demos and tutorials that you do in the class are focused on are like bringing students along the journey to arrive at one of those projects. So it could be taught within the context of one class. And, and oftentimes the students in the generative design and generative typography class, they do do like self-initiated projects within the scope of those classes that don't necessarily cross over to any other class. It's kind of up to the student, you know, if a student has a busier semester or they have other stuff going on, you know, they might, decide to do a more like a smaller more research focused project in the generative design class i think you know as long as they have a way to apply what they're learning that's kind of the big the big thing any other feedback to that anyone else there is a yes puya <laughs> so if i could kind of maybe just dig a little bit deeper on that one if we are to teach some classes that are um, maybe a, um, a smaller kind of uh, modular kind of uh, system as you as you discussed and and not worry too much about the, the fancy technologies that we have or not mm -hmm. um, in state universities and, and, and maybe Republican universities as you put it um, and how much of that actual hands-on knowledge do the instructors need to have themselves you know because you know if we were not trained in transmedia ourselves you know, because part of it is conceptual, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But there's, a, there's a kind of quite a significant presence of technical um, skills that need to be present. 
and you know how much you know if you could you could balance that how would we bring that to uh, to our classes any thoughts on that yeah um roy do you want to feel that one or do you want me to yeah i think like for the generative design and generative type class there's a lot of you know like we use processing which is available online for free mm -hmm. so i think that's one big thing you know and it it works across mac and pc which is another thing that is really you know some some of the tools that we use in design don't don't always cross over both platforms like that. So I think you know tools like processing things like P5JS. Those are all open source projects that are free and and you know they have a, a really supportive and, and big community around them. And so even as a you know when I was in school there wasn't a processing class so I kind of was more self taught. Um, but because and the only reason I was able to do that is just because of how much there was in terms of resources and, and you have people like Daniel Schiffman who has the coding train YouTube um, you know channel where he's posting videos for free where, where a lot of our students are watching those videos to supplement some of the stuff that we're learning in the class so I think you know if you have the it's you know if you have the time as a, as a teacher to kind of invest in learning that stuff you can then apply it more directly but you know in the same way that students are learning when they're working on projects, you also are learning. Like for me, when I when I when a student asks me a question about something in code, I always have to be like, oh, I don't know off the top of my head. Let me figure that out. So you know, again, it's just like a subject matter that's always tricky to work with because there's so much knowledge to retain that it's impossible. And so like that's the other thing that I think we talk a lot with the students about when it comes to like new tools and technologies. You know, it, it's okay to like look things up and to do more exploration outside of the bounds of the class like there's a lot to cover so I'm not sure if that 100 percent answers the question but it, it it speaks to the idea that it's all that it's open source and there's a certain ethos within that community where where, where it's it's more about sharing than it is about proprietary ownership and 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 that that's kind of the spirit of generosity within within designers and programmers that work in that space mm -hmm. um, I, I would say again, you know, part of what is important too is, is for it to exist within the context of graphic design, for it to be applicable and relevant to a graphic design project too. Um, and, and that's kind of, I mean, that's a really powerful combination, you know, um, because, um, you know, when, when graphic designers are able to, to kind of move beyond the, the prepackaged tools like Illustrator or Photoshop or um, you know, in design, things like that. Um, then they're able to, to feel empowered to create new things. There's a certain kind of maker ethos at work too. Um, I, I personally know that I, I, I know from personal experience this summer, I, I, I'll be full disclosure, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm in a way kind of auditing Roy's gen design class and I'm hovering in the back, I'm on sabbatical, but I'm kind of hovering in the background. And cause I wanna learn, I wanna learn code. And, um, you know, I, I feel like from a conceptual standpoint, I have an understanding of, of procedural operations and computational design, how that stuff works. And, you know, when it comes to concepts and ideas that, that I'm comfortable there. Um, but when it comes to the actual process of, of writing software, of writing code, you know, I, I feel like as a, as a graphic design instructor that's been doing things in a certain kind of way over an amount of time, I'm not sure I could transition and just teach code. I, I don't know if I would be skilled at doing that. Um, and that, that's in many ways, that's why when, you know, I, I always kept in touch with Roy after he graduated. And when he, he mentioned that he was maybe interested in, in coming back to teach, I jumped at the chance to, right. to, to see if he would want to collaborate on these, on these classes and these projects. Because he, he understands that space, you know, in, in a, in a deep, in the way that Roy teaches it also, he doesn't teach it as if he's the expert, you know, he teaches it side by side with students and they figure out things together. And I think they really appreciate that. So I'm going to ask Milka, uh, she didn't raise her hand in the raise the hand app, but first we'll ask Milka will ask a question and then Robert Baxter, he's next, but Milka go first. Uh, first of all, thank you, Brad and Roy, and of course, Gloria for this opportunity. I learned so much and I'm so inspired that uh, what I'm asking, and I think everyone else might agree with this, as you, and as you mentioned, we learn by making. Mm -hmm. Have you considered after today to possibly put a 
workshop together, maybe a weekend workshop. Gloria, I know you mentioned after the, the pandemic, but that's mm. way too late because after that, <laughs> we have post AI. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm curious to know if that's something could be on the map uh, as a consideration to, because all of us are interested and we want to teach it. I myself, I'm an adjunct professor and I'm also uh, working, uh, you know, in the corporate world. So, and, and they are asking me about AI design and I really want to learn. So if that would be a possibility, I would really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, let, let me, let me say that I would love to do that. I'd love to work with uh, Brad and with Roy and with Constantine, who also um, is another transmedia instructor. Um, will the HMCT will struggle to put something together? Um, I, 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 can, I can feel my staff behind my neck wanting to choke me because of all the work it takes to do this. But I agree with you, Milka. I think we should continue this and we should build a much more smaller and intensive mm. workshop on how to teach this. What's, in, what's the uh, components? I mean, Brad and Roy did share some of, the, uh, some of the components, but it is very deep. It's not just about technology. Mm, it's yeah. about what, we talked about it earlier, what frames the class is about storytelling. So there's a lot of, you know, the brand of the story that you're building and then mm. how is that affected in the different media platforms? And that's really the core of the class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I hope, yes, Milka, I promise I'll put something together. Um, Robert, thanks, Milka. you have a question. Hello, just want to say thanks. First of all, that was, that was fantastic and very invigorating to see. Um, I think one of the questions that I have is when you're teaching uh, experimental media and new media to students, what you sort of do to um, help them through self-censorship and to help them figure out what their capabilities are in that space. I saw, I really liked the bit about doing things like storyboarding before actually getting into the logistics of how do we make this happen. And I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a culture of them seeing, you know, what their peers and other students are working on. Um, but outside of that, how do you sort of set what they believe they can do? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, there's so many intangibles in, involved in, in the classroom experience. And it's, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for, for me, again, you know, part of it is kind of inverting the hierarchy of the classroom and empowering the students to some degree to kind of, you know, um, not control the class, but to feel like their ideas have value, that their, their, their opinions matter, their point of view is, is something that um, is, is appreciated. And, and then students kind of open up, you know, they open up, you create the conditions for learning and you create a, a safe space for ideas. And, and the students feel a little bit more open in, in sharing their ideas and not self-censoring or self-editing so much. Um, you know, really, it's all about process. I mean, we talk about processing as, 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 as a coding language, but it's also about design process and embracing the design process. Mm. And, um, and, you know, learning through making, again, the mantra that we have at Art Center that I, I'm a firm believer in, too, in my own design practice, that's incredibly valuable. Um, so you, you make, you, you share, you, 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 you give feedback, um, you, you get feedback on your work. There's friend, and in the best case scenarios, there's friendly peer to peer pressure, not the negative kind, but the positive kind. And, and I, I, in, in, in my classrooms, um, every, every class session is, is a group critique. I'll say that. And that, that's maybe something I have a, I went to, I went to Cranbrook for graduate school and Miles Mazzi, who teaches media texture also went to Cranbrook and that's more a studio environment, studio learning environment. So that, that was a part of my formative process as an educator. Mm. And, and so, you know, I believe in the collective mind of the classroom. I believe in the studio environment. Um, and so I'd say about 80% of my class sessions are group critiques mm. and maybe 20% are one-on-ones. Mm. And, um, and know, that's towards the end, isn't it, Brad? Usually it's one-on-one -on -one yeah. towards the end. Towards you know, the end where, when where you really, really have to, time. yeah, because yeah. each project has its own, it has its own, mm set of rules and logic, you know, and right. you, you have to kind of, you have to do that in a very individual, individualistic kind of right. you know, setting, right. you know, oh, does that answer your question? I hope it does. 
And next question, I'm, go I'm gonna go in order so you know who's next, is David Wolski, then Liz, and then oh, cool. Rick. Those are people who, that's the order in which the hands were raised. So after David, it's Liz, then Rick. Hi, thanks, uh, Brad and Roy. That was a, a really great presentation. Um, you talked a lot about empowering the students and creating a safe space for them to experiment. And I'm just wondering if um, the students also seek out um, external feedback or from stakeholders outside of the, the classroom or the learning environment? Do they work with um, clients and get feedback on the projects in transmedia or is that something that is uh, left to other classes? We, we have a lot of classes that are, are sponsored project classes. And I would imagine the dynamic in those classes is, is, is maybe a little bit different than the more exploratory focus that we have in transmedia because they have to deliver, you know, within, um, you, know, you have a creative brief and you have to deliver, um, you know, a clearly defined set of, you know, deliverables or, or, or you know, elements of graphic design at the end of 14 weeks. And, and in some ways that there's, and what I like about Art Center is there's such a broad variety of classes. You know, you might have classes that allow a student to explore something that is deeply meaningful to them conceptually. You, you might have a class that allows a student to learn emerging tools and technologies. You might have a class that allows a student to gain professional experience. And, and so, um, you know, I like that there's a broad variety of approaches but within the transmedia classes, you know, they're a little bit more exploratory. They're a little bit more process oriented. And it's a little less about kind of the, the deliverable or the end result. And, and some, you know, they do deliver, but it's less about, um, you know, I'll say this, you know, hopefully this makes sense. In some ways, it's more about asking questions and solving problems. Mm -hmm. And I know that's antithetical to some design methodologies, but I feel like that's how new things perhaps happen, you know. Great. Thanks. Liz? Um, I, I think you actually like answered a lot of my questions in your previous two um, answers, but I'm totally fascinated with the, the ideas of scaling down, finding ways to add this to our programs and working with technologies that, that we're not comfortable as educators. But I know that my, my students have a very low tolerance for failure and for mm. going into the unknown. And for me, the only way mm. I can really big, build that in is with a lot of accountability. So I was just I, wondering of what, I know you have constant crits, but what levels of accountability all the way along are there to, to keep them sort of on track? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the critique dynamic is really important along those lines. I mean, it's like, you don't want to come into class empty handed. You know, it's, you don't make a student feel bad. You never do. And, and, and they're, they're, they're young and, and they're still learning who they are as people for the most part. Um, but there, there's that element of, of, of wanting to, to bring something in and to share something. And that, that kind of raises the bar a little bit. Um, and, and critique itself is kind of an art form. You know, it's like, how do you defend your ideas without seeming defensive? Um, you know, how do you provide critical feedback that isn't, you know, just soul crushing? And, and, and how do you support ideas that a student may or may not know if they're valuable? You know, it's like, I would say that there's, it's an interesting space to be in when you create something, you know, it has an energy, but you can't tell if it's good or bad. And what I say is that you may not have a fr frame of reference for knowing if it's good or bad. You might be doing something entirely new or it might be bad. It might, you know, you don't know, you have to take risks. And, and so a lot of it comes down to, to kind of just, some of the intangibles, the support that we talked about, the culture of transmedia, I think is helpful, especially with these new tools and technologies. Um, you know, I, I'll say, you know, there, there, Gloria mentioned a few instructors. There's another instructor, and his name is Ivan Cruz, that, that I can't say how valuable, he's so valuable to a lot of the, you know, like Roy, he was a student at Art Center um, about eight years ago, nine years ago. And so he's been to the program. And so he's able to connect with students, even as an instructor in ways that we can't. And so he, he's, he's, he's very adept with, with and very genuinely interested in new tools and technologies. And so as, as, as we've mentioned, we try to build 
cross pedagogical synergies between classes. And, and I know if, if conceptually there's an idea, but you know, technically it's hard for me to figure out or solve. I have no problem whatsoever, you know, kind of, you know, pulling in, pulling in my, my team or, you know, the, my fellow colleagues and, 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 and working in a very kind of communal collective way. Um, but in terms of accountability, you know, it's really just about pacing yourself and structuring a class in a way you want to structure a class so that you build forgiveness into it, but it's also paced in a certain kind of way, you know, and, and, and things have to move along, you know, um, you have to be really, you know, empathy is really important and you have to really feel for the students if they're struggling and they're being genuine with you. Um, and you have to give them space to, to kind of pull themselves out of whatever they're in to, to kind of, uh, kind of level up to the rest of the class. So there are a lot of intangibles at work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I don't even know if I would use the word accountability. That scares me a little bit, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, I would just say, you know, just embracing the process takes a little bit off the, the kind of the guaranteed end result, which, which could be said for a lot of things in, in right. life. There are always, well, and we talked about this uh, earlier. I, Rick, is, Rick is, has got the next question, but as I said, students learn at different paces. Mm -hmm. There are ladder learners, yep. people who mm -hmm. go up each rung when they're supposed to learn something, and then there's the plateau learner the student who needs more time to get the concept, more time mm. to understand. So they might be down here at the bottom and then all of a sudden, oh, I get mm. it. Yep. And they join everyone else at that third rung up. So accountability eventually does come in and, and Brad and Roy know this when they're set for their final. Mm -hmm. You try to keep them accountable. We try to keep them accountable along the way because we know that they will be in trouble if they don't reach certain goals. But again, every student is, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Not everyone moves at the same pace, but I'm going to be quiet. And Rick, you can ask. <laughs> yeah, thanks for identifying the plateau learner for all the plateau learners out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, my question is that, um, so, the media texture and the generative type and the sort of tr transmedia approach, it, I feel like I could really use a little map that shows me where all of these sort of approaches live. And one of the ones that helps me anchor the experiences that you guys teach would be Zach Lieberman's computational poetics mm -hmm. world. Totally. And mm -hmm. if you can help me understand like what the sort of general field-wide ideas are around around the map that shows us where all of these are that would help me get some sort of geographical grounding what, what does that what does that mean to you guys in your work yeah uh, go for it go ahead Roy go ahead I was just gonna say like the you know Zach Lieberman's school that he has in New York is is really interesting I, I know for for me when I was uh first learning about all this stuff, I was paying a lot of attention to what was happening at NYU's ITP program, where Dan Schiffman um, and a bunch of other really interesting designers and artists are kind of working with code, both in an art and design context, but in a really broad way, um, working with like uh, writing as well as like visual art and, and more applied design projects. And then, you know, there's programs like UCLA's DMA program where Casey Reese, one of the, mm -hmm. one of the creators of processing teaches, um, you know, Carnegie Mellon has a lot of interesting stuff going on with Golan Levin um, and the kind of like lab that he mm -hmm. has there for research. So I think like that's kind of how, so that was the kind of thing that I was referencing and, and thinking through when I was creating the generative design and generative type classes. Um, and so I think like, the way that I've been thinking about it, at least from my perspective, is of how we're positioning in it, this type of work and projects is, you know, more around like how this work is being applied directly to graphic design. Because that was one thing that I noticed was really missing, at least when I was looking for stuff. When you were looking at processing examples or processing tutorials, you know, they would lean in one direction or another, maybe more art or maybe like more, you know, engineering and computer science focused some of the stuff is like way over my head in terms of complexity. 
Um, so that stuff was always hard for me to engage with. The art stuff was hard for me to bring into the class because you know, a lot of my teachers didn't want me to make art. They wanted me to make graphic design. So I think like that, that tension there was kind of interesting. So I think that's kind of how I, the mental map that I kind of built out is in my mind is like, um, there's a lot of precedent for it. Like in the classes we talk about, you know, Muriel Cooper and the work that she was doing at MIT. So we bring in a lot of like designers that have been working with technology in kind of different and interesting ways and kind of approach it from that, uh, from that perspective. Great, great that you mention all of these people. And, I, and thank you, Rick, for giving us uh, the, uh, uh, the right name for computational poetics. And, um, you know, again, everyone sharing if they have um, websites, and, and that's great. But I, we forget about Miro Cooper mm. and how important she was in terms of developing and the use of typography and processing and generating design. Oh, totally, for sure. Really, really a, a forerunner. I know Harant has the next question. So. Oh. <clears throat> yes, I was uh, born in a wet blanket, so that's my role here. I have a question about uh, the stuff you showed is very compelling, very attractive. Typography, to me, has a necessary textual component, and it's very difficult, I think, to convey a lot of text in such environments, especially when it's moving. So I'm wondering if how much text do you manage to deliver reliably? How much text do you think is possible to do? Um, just because of the way the human vision works. Like yeah. if your eyes are moving, you can only move your eyes smoothly if, some, if you're following a moving object mm. versus if you're looking at a static page, you're jumping around. So it's, right. it's interesting to me how, if it's possible to overcome that somehow. I'm, I'm gonna let Brad and Roy answer this, but I just want to say, Harant, and to everyone else, you only saw what I would consider a very sliver of the projects. And again, I think the use of text and how the text is used in Brad and Roy's class, I'll let you take over, is always appropriate to the media. Yeah, I, I'd say that's a, that's a really good, it's actually, your, your question's a really good question. And it's not a wet blanket question at all. It's a good question. And um, I, I say, you know, say in the realm of print-based media, um, you know, I, I, make, I make an analogy to, 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 to track, okay, to track. So you have posters, you have booklets, and you have books. So you have long-form media, short-form, medium-form media, and short-form media. You know, a poster is like a sprinter. You know, it's got to elicit um, a response in the viewer in about two and a half seconds. It's got to, it's got to, it's got it, you know, it's something that you really feel in your gut as much as, you know, process in your brain. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it has to have dramatic impact. I'll steal a phrase from Miles Mazzi who teaches media texture. When you look at a poster, it should make your heart beat a little bit faster, you know. Um, now a book is on the other end of that time scale. A book is like a marathon runner. And, and I, 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 you know, it's interesting that Gloria brought up Muriel Cooper and, and Roy as well. Um, what I like about her, her pre she was a book designer. She was an incredible book designer. That's long form media. That couldn't, you would think that there's nothing further away from, you know, new tools and technologies and books, but it's not entirely true at all. You know, how can, you know, new, new technologies are in fact giving us more tools to, to kind of work with new production methods when it comes to making books. But going back to the cognitive payload that we have with book, you know, a book is, a book is, is something that conveys information over a duration of time, you know, and there's a certain, it, within the context of a book, you can make very, very compelling and deep arguments, you know, it's a rhetorical kind of mechanism. And there's a profound cognitive engagement we have with material in, in book form. And that's very different from the way that information and typography is conveyed in, in a poster. You know, right in the middle, you have middle distance runner, you know, you, you know, 400 meter runner, and that's booklets and brochures and, and the kind of information that should be conveyed there, um, where it's more about concision. And the, and the writing is a big part of this too. It, it, you know, the writing should be sympathetic to the medium with which it's displayed. Now, when it comes to large environmental graphics, it's really about, it really is about concision, you know, and in many ways, you don't want to read a lot of text um, when it's moving on the side of a building. 
You know, you, you, it, it's, it's less about reading and it's more about experiencing that information with your body. That's why I find virtual reality to be an interesting, interesting space to begin to explore how information is, is it, it, virtual reality is not a website. You know, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not a poster. It exists in four dimensions. It has the potential to be interactive. And so how, where does type live in a virtual reality space? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that, that to me is very interesting. Um, you know, so I think you have to approach every media type on its own terms. You have to understand the affordances and characteristics of each one and make sure that the messaging and the writing is appropriate for that. And understand that there's a certain threshold, like even on Zoom right now, there's a certain cognitive threshold that you reach when your brain is too sad. Like when Mariah and I were putting together this, this presentation, we were sensitive to that. We wanted to order the project so that there was one that might be a little bit more maximal versus one that might be a little bit, kind of clear the palate a little bit, you know, be a little bit more minimal. So you, you think about how the brain processes information. You think about the intention of your design for a given audience. Um, you know, you think about the affordances and characteristics of a given medium and you prototype and you test drive different possibilities to see which one is the most effective. I, I, um, I hope that answered your question. Does someone else have a question? I, are people, is the hand raising thing working? Jack. Was that with me? Yeah. Hey, Jamie. Um, so I, just from a, uh, teaching perspective, um, how much of these classes are, you know, you, you, you showed all this incredible work um, and, and it has, you know, so much beautiful graphic design underlying it, but it seems so complex to produce. Is the bulk of these classes teaching technical skills in order to be able to produce this? And these, these kids come to you with, you know, really well-formed, you know, design backgrounds already because they're juniors or seniors at this point, or are you kind of helping them through the the art direction and design process simultaneously? I'd say, you know, again, it, a lot of it comes, a lot of, a lot of what we try to do is build, build crossover between different classes. And um, so we have students take classes in tandem with each other. And, and one class might deal with some research aspects or something that involves the development of, of a narrative if it's a book design class or the development of an identity system if it's uh, say a type five transmedia class, which we've talked about today. And, 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 and in tandem with that, students take classes that are sympathetic to those classes, that fit with those classes. And, and so, you know, um, as Roy and I talked about a little bit today, we love when students take a class like generative type in tandem with type five, you know, transmedia. And, and I know that the, I know that when they take Roy's classes, um, they're going to have a historical understanding of the evolution of that way of making graphic design. There's a strong intellectual component to it. And I also know that they're also going to have a series of exercises and, and um, a logical sequencing of the introduction of all these concepts in his class so that, you know, the, the technical side of things, the tools and technology side of things, is, is in many ways, um, you know, um, let's say not in one class, kind of outsourced in a way. And, and, and we know that during the weekend workshops as well, you know, I'll talk to Roy, I'll talk to Miles, and we'll talk about students. You know, what, is, what do you think that this student might need in order to kind of get over the hump in their project? The other um, thing... And so yeah. we work super closely together and, and we kind of build pedagogy so that there's a strong crossover among the classes. And we, we, I'll say that the intangible thing is we, liked, we like working together too. You know, we, we, enjoy, we enjoy talking about ideas. We enjoy the process. When you ask what they come in with, what skills, Jamie, were you at yesterday's Essential Typography? Oh, that's... With Simon that's, and, and uh, that's Ty. That's huge. I mean, huge. What, yeah. what you see at Art Center, and we're very fortunate that but it's an art and design school, a conservatory school. By the time they reach type five, which we would consider the pinnacle of the type program, they have taken type one, type two, type three, type four. And in all those type classes, and in addition to that, they've taken narrative or perhaps even editorial design. So they have a huge, huge, foundation by the time they get to type five of at least 
foundational studies of typographic design and graphic design. It, they, they cannot take transmedia design walking through the door. Now, maybe, I don't know, I, I, it might scare them, but what you see, the transmedia design program is really what they exit Art Center at. Yeah, that, I was primarily wondering about the generative type stuff because it seems like it requires so much technical skill that, you know, there wouldn't be time to kind of, you know, help them too much through the design process. So I was wondering if it was primarily a technical class or if it was sort of a, a combo. Um, yeah, but, it's kind of a, yeah, it's combo. pretty much a combo, yeah. I think the thing that I kind of struck, like having gone through the Art Center graphic design program myself, I kind of, no, and having my TA that I had last semester, um, you know, we kind of know like the specific sequencing of, of code and, and the way to teach it that will work best for the types of projects that students are going to be learning uh, or, or sorry, uh, working on in the transmedia and other classes. So I think like for me, when I'm teaching that class, we do focus a lot on, on like concept and ideation and sketching and design as much as we do with code. But I think the way that we teach code is like just, just the, enough to be able to do the projects that they want to do. So it is very easy to like take a concept like, um, like functions, for example, and spend like three weeks talking about all the different ways that you can do it. But if students are only going to use it in one way, then I only teach that way of using it. Mm -hmm. And similarly, like we start to, we start to learn about, um, you know, things like object oriented programming. I spend like one class just briefly talking about that because students don't really learn it or need, students don't really use it in any of their projects. So I found that, that just kind of editing the stuff that you're showing and making all of the demos kind of contextualize the types of projects they're gonna be doing. So I think that was another thing I'm, I was really conscious of. So kind of what I was talking about before, all the demos and tutorials and a lot of the you know code books that you read they have exercises like when you're learning how to, when you're learning object oriented programming, it'll be like you design a little alien character that bounces around the mm -hmm. screen. But for our students, like if they read that book, it doesn't mean anything to them because they're mm -hmm. like, well, how, how does this, you know, how does this work with what I'm doing in school? So, right. you know, when I teach that example, we actually do that gravity type thing I was show that was on one of the slides where they can type on their keyboard and letters fall down the screen. It's the same set of code, but then someone in that class can then say, oh, I liked how that was working. And then they take other code that they're finding online. They're combining it with the code that they're writing in the class. And then that allows them to kind of, you know, move that project forward in a way that is really quick, actually. Like, it's always surprising for me. Um, you know, when I was trying to learn this stuff myself 10 years ago, I see how fast students pick it up, you know, like they're, maybe the generation below me um, and they pick it up so fast. It's crazy. I think the other thing is I know Robert has a question. He just walked away, but um, this was an interesting, um, Brad and I were talking with Phil Gilbert, who's head mm -hmm. of um, a design for IBM. I mean, he's head of 2,500 designers. And one of the issues or one of the concepts of what makes a, what will make a good designer is not to wrestle the technology. You know, I think you don't come in as a designer and say, I'm going to make this technology work for me. In other words, you need to sit back and maybe this is an interesting process of look at what the, how the technology can inform your design mm -hmm. instead of the other way around, you know, yeah. allow what the programming that Roy uses to perhaps shape the design that you think you might be thinking of. I mean, and that was uh, almost an aha moment. And he got that from after visiting the letterpress shop, because we have a great letterpress shop as well as great transmedia. And why they work together is that our technology and letterpress is so old, we already know the technology. So understanding of the technology and how you can push it at this point, I mean, there are some fantastic letterpress you know, people, designers, artists who are doing great things with the technology mm. because they are letting the technology telling them what to do and then responding with it. And that I think is, is going to be the change. And that's why I think a lot of the students are coming in, as Roy would say, they pick it up quickly because I, they maybe they're allowing the technology 
to inform their design instead of maybe 10 years ago, you used to jump on the technology and say, I'm going to make you do this yeah, yeah, yeah. immediately. I think they're more comfortable with that concept. Um, anyway, Robert, do you have a... It's just a direct follow up on that. I mean, first, first of all, super kudos for putting together that program and, and for having institutional support for that. I think what I've witnessed a lot is, is the sort of other side of, of institutions trying to, um, trying to make people that can put coding as a line on their resume, you know, so it, it, it doesn't really serve the purpose of the work that they're doing so much as it serves getting, getting through that, um, that hoop. Uh, so I, I really like the approach that you guys are talking about. And I think that in particular, I just wanted to say, um, as people are talking about workshops and future things, is something worth, worth documenting and spreading because that seems like a really, a really functional model that I don't get to see a lot in institutions. Yeah. Very cool. Thank I you. I think one cool thing, just to, you know, bring it back to the HMCT and the, and the, you know, programs that are there. One cool thing is like when we're coding everything, the student, a lot of the students have had the experience of working with metal type before. Yeah. And the way that we structure the software is literally like building little yeah. rectangular pieces of type in code and then setting those next to each other with spacing, with letting, with all of that stuff. And so they've had that hands-on experience setting type in that way. And then they're able to work with code. And you know, when we work on the data visualization and text analysis stuff, I always ask students like, okay, we have one exercise where we take a book and we analyze the frequency of occurrence of letters in the book. And I say like, do you know which letter is gonna be the most frequently occurring? And a lot of them don't know, but I show like the California job case and I'm like, see how big the E is? The E is the most commonly occurring. So I think like trying, to me, it's like the technologies are always super, to me, like this is just another technology, just like letterpress and all that stuff is a technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I feel like we're really, we're really, the students benefit a lot from having had that experience because, you know, they don't really think about it in terms, I think what I'm starting to see is they're thinking about it less from like a high tech kind of perspective and it's just another tool for them. I think the one thing that I do hear a lot, which is interesting, um, is they're kind of curious like how they can do this professionally. They're, they always ask like, what design studio can I do this at? And I'm like, it's more interesting if you bring it into a design studio that's not doing it and provide that as something that, that you can do that's unique to the way that you make work. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's, that's something that I feel like is really encouraged within the program and, you know, having all these resources that they have, like the letterpress, the access to the letterpress and HMCT mm -hmm. in general is super good for sure. Do you have a question? Um, I just wanted to, uh, also point out that uh, Brad and Roy talked about the value uh, and the importance of the, the TAs and the students are learning a lot from the TAs and from each other. Um, I, I had the benefit of being in one of uh, Brad and Roy's critiques back in February and um, I really got to observe how much the students are learning from one another in terms of the the code and the technology also yeah i mean it's again the collective the collective experience the communal atmosphere is is really important for them to to really engage in these new tools and technologies that they otherwise would shy away from there's that kind of level of encouragement and support which is really important and in the critique, you know, again, you know, you try to invert the critique so that the students are the teachers and the teacher is, is learning as much from the students, uh, you know. It, you know, it was, it was funny, my, I have, again, I have a, a son, Joshua, and he just started second grade, when he just started second grade, he said something to me that was, you know how little kids can say things and you're just like, oh my God, that's brilliant. I, it's wrong, but it's brilliant. And he said, that the students should be the teachers because the teachers are always asking us for answers. And I thought that's just quite brilliant in a way coming from a, a, a little guy, but there's, there's truth in that, you know, and I think that a lot of it goes towards the intangible, you know, kind of connection that you, 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 you have in the classroom with the students and the students have with each other and the teaching assistants that they'll, they'll, I mean, they, they, I, I, it's unbelievable the amount of time and, and energy they'll give to a class. And, and as we mentioned earlier, Roy, 
where he was my teaching assistant for almost two years solid, which is get, dedicating a lot of time if you're an art center, if you're at art center, and in knowing, as Gloria mentioned, knowing some of these classes and how demanding they are. But it's just you want to be a part of you want to be a part of it, and um, not that it's like a cult or anything like that, but you just want to be a part of the the, the exchange of ideas, and um, you know, there, there's just there, it's it's addictive in a way, you know. But I, I'm a firm believer in fostering young teachers and, and giving them a, a space in the classroom to, to kind of a platform really for them to test drive their abilities to teach. Everyone has a possibility of being a teacher. It's inside everyone. And um, you try to create space in the classroom for a potential teacher to, to begin to find their voice. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's an important, it's, it's part of that kind of like, alchemy that happens in the classroom and everyone here is a teacher you know what I mean you know when it comes together and and students are discovering things in their work it's just so powerful it, there's a kind of magnetism to a good idea and when students see other students make those connections you know it, it's a little burst of energy for them to to, to feel confident in following ideas and, and and giving shape to them and then sharing them with each other and finding support in what they share you know and, and so that those intangibles are really important too. And I, 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 can't, I can't underscore that enough. You can't really, it's hard to give a lecture and talk about those intangibles, but in this format, which, which Gloria has put together, I feel like we can talk a little bit about that stuff, that shared experience we all have as educators that we know is quite magical. Is there someone else? Uh, did I miss someone who had a question? Because maybe your raise the hand is working or not working and I don't want to be, you know, I think everyone, oh, Puya, go ahead. So, um, sorry, I'm thinking a little bit maybe too pragmatically today. Um, and part of us kind of trying to kind of imagine possibilities of how we can kind of have some space in our programs to kind of teach transmedia or, or related um, um, kind of projects, classes, courses. Um, we're asked to always to think about how will this kind of learning um, affect the students kind of future perspectives mm -hmm. in their, you know, jobs and careers and of course I can think of things like you know expanding how they think about technology and kind of exploring a unknown uncharted territories that uh, our students were uh, will face ahead um, any thoughts on adding to that list I mean I and, and Roy can speak Roy can follow up as well but I, I think you know, typically a graphic design, it, you know, learning to work with code-based tools is a, is a way of making forms and ex expressing ideas. Um, but if you're working on a large team and you understand the language of code, inevitably you're probably gonna be working with someone who's an expert that's like got a degree in computer science that will take those ideas that, you're, that you, it's a shared language that you would have with that individual or that team. And they would take those ideas and they would really kind of run with them. And so we just want to introduce graphic designers to code-based thinking, code-based learning. We want them to understand that language so that they can communicate and collaborate with others that, you know, are, are, are experts within that, within that realm, within that field. Yeah, I think for me, when, when I, everyone used, like when I was in school, you know, the, the web was kind of just getting to the point where you could pick your own fonts to use and you didn't have to use system fonts and that kind of thing and so and like responsive design didn't exist so no one wanted to work on any digital projects iphone apps had just come out so i was like more excited about that and, and a lot of my peers didn't understand why or didn't really care about that stuff and like i took a semester off from art center and like moved back into my parents house to like learn programming because I felt like I could do a lot of really cool projects with it in school if I just dedicated a, a long enough amount of time to learning it. And I think like one thing that I've seen in my, you know, in the last like eight years of working professionally, um, and I've worked in a lot of different contexts, like I've worked in small studios, I've worked in house at like big companies, I've worked at startups. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that, that the types of projects I did in the transmedia classes and the code that I was learning, it kind of changed how I thought about design a little bit. I became more like systematic in my approach. And so that allowed me to then transition from a very traditional at the time graphic design program to then working on apps and websites as an interaction designer, uh, you know, and, and moving across different kind of disciplines within design that I probably wouldn't have been as well 
able, like I wouldn't have probably been able to do that as well if I had maybe a more, you know, linear kind of graphic mm. design education that didn't, that didn't ask questions of me that I wouldn't have asked of myself if I were kind of just going through the program um, mm. without that. So I think like that, you know, it's hard to, it's like such an intangible thing, but I think like working in this way just changes how, and I see it in the classes when I'm teaching students how to code and they start to experiment with that medium. Like you can kind of see there's this shift where they realize like, oh, I can now do this on a project or like I can approach this project from this way. Like I encourage my students to write a lot. I see them writing a lot more. So I think like th these types of projects just require a certain level of research and, and intellectual rigor that isn't absent in other projects, but that we just kind of ask it of the students a little bit more. And, and when you're working with code, you kind of have to, you know, bring a little bit, you, you have to, it's, I always joke with my students that have my 8 a.m. coding class that <coughs> they should probably take the afternoon one too at some point just to make sure that they're awake because mm. a lot of them have pulled all-nighters and then coming into writing code at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. is kind of rough. But yeah, I think it's a lot of intangible stuff, but it just really changes how you think, I, I feel like. So we're coming to the end of our um, oh. uh, of our class, I'm sorry to say, which is the end of the event. And we have one more swag giveaway. Now this is, you've been hearing my last name over the last four days, <laughs> several times. And you can see it on the screen. Who can tell me? where my genetic background or my background is from. The first person to know mm. by looking at my last name can tell what my ancestry is, what country, you will get the final prize. So far, no one's gotten it. <gasps> oh, Harant. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? Wait, you gotta unmute. Not fair. I remembered something. I wrote, uh, I don't know why I wrote check first. Sorry, I hope that doesn't disqualify me. But I remembered uh, because I do have a computer science degree and the inventor of the C++ uh, language was, his last name was Strauss Troop. That's right. And uh, the OOP ending uh, made me remember that. So. That's right. Very good. That's exactly what it is, the D-R-U-P. So Harant, you get our... Uh, I know Rick, Rick and David are gonna kill themselves for not getting this right, because I'm gonna share my screen so you can see. And Harant, you have been to all of our sessions, so you deserve it anyway. But you will Ooh, get, nice. I know, you will get a very limited edition oh, nice. of, of uh, Vernon Simpson's wow. uh, letterpress poster for his uh, celebration of the 200th birthday of Los Angeles. Oh, wow, my favorite city. Uh, you live here, so <laughs> it has never been published. We just happen to have the Vernon Simpson archive. So congratulations, Haran, for being Thank very you. smart. It was a nice way, I think, to end on a very, from a very high tech note to the very low tech note. Love it. Full so, circle. Sure. Full circle, which is what we want. So. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Please, you're, you're all on our MailChimp list. Thank you, Brad and Roy. It's always a pleasure. I love, 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 and I miss sneaking in or just coming down to your classes. Same, same, yeah, Gloria. It's thank, the and, same. And thank you for, for putting this together. Yeah. And we're, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're just, we're so thankful to be a part of, to be a part of this. And I just got a text from Ty along those same lines, yeah. you know, and um, you're such a powerful advocate for typographic education well, and nothing, nothing holds you back. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been, it's been an honor to be a part of this. So thank you for you. No, thank you. It's because I can work with such great instructors and great colleagues and a great, and I have to thank my staff, Clifford, Pun, if it wasn't for Clifford and Susan Malmstrom, <laughs> and I don't know where she is, if she's here or she's, if she's, she's here. And Susan, <laughs> congrat, and Rachel Elnar, who is our wonderful consultant who helped us put all this together. I've learned a lot about how to do this. So next time I'm going to do it even better. <laughs> Watch out. Good morning, America.
Thank you, Gloria. You are great, such a great hostess and moderator. For sure. Thank you. thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. And have a great night. Stay healthy, stay well, so we can all but go back to a physical space once, it, once this ends. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks, Gloria. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.